So in 1925, Davison and Germer uh, did Bragg diffraction, the, the diffraction that we discussed at the beginning of the chapter, from a crystal but with electrons, and were able to see an interference pattern. So this was, of course, a huge deal because uh, prior to this, there, while there was um, the de Broglie uh, hypothesis that the, the, the Bohr quantization condition, right, the fact that the Bohr orbits are quantized is due to the electrons having wave-like properties. So Davis and Germer were able to show this. Remember Bragg diffraction. In two dimensions, we sort of showed it, uh, and I, I will go into three dimensions, but in two dimensions, we showed if you shine light into uh, the crystal structure and uh, it is reflected by the crystal planes that if it's reflected off of two subsequent planes that you get an interference pattern. I didn't actually, I'll, I'll spend a little time here sort of showing the, trying to show the three-dimensional apparatus which you read about in the book, but, uh, but regardless, we found uh, the, the Bragg um, diffraction condition. Remember, we, we actually talked, um, sorry, we talked about interference from the point of view of light many times, and we know that light interferes, and that is a property of, so, of something that has a wave-like property. The, what was special about Bragg diffraction was that um, X-rays, which were not well understood in the early 1900s, uh, were, were, which, and couldn't be interfered through a normal diffraction grating, turns out because their wavelength was too small, did diffract from the crystal planes because the spacing of the crystal planes was more comparable to the wavelength of the x-rays. So now, new experiment, Bohr um, condition that, that the orbits are quantized, Du Bois tries to explain it through saying maybe electrons have wave-like properties, and Davison and Germer redo the Bragg diffraction experiment but with electrons from an electron gun and indeed show electron interference. We actually do this experiment in advanced lab um, so if you're taking that course you'll be able to see this experiment done. If there was no um, diffraction and interference uh, the, and, and simply reflection let's just say find a reasonable color let's just make it um, let's just say that this would be my straight through transmission axis and what you find is that you get interference fringes and just there we go interference fringes which are at angles from the original right of let's say call it angle phi from the original path and those interference fringes in Bragg scattering right nothing special about electrons but for Bragg scattering those interference fringes were found at d sine phi equals and lambda. So that's just a regular interference condition. What's fantastic is that we're interfering electrons and we're seeing similar patterns. Now we still need to understand the wavelength of the electron um, but we're seeing similar patterns. So what Davison and Germer were able to do was take an electron gun, shoot it at a crystal, um, and shoot those, that electron beam at a crystal, see an interference pattern, and then take that interference pattern, calculate the wavelength, and go back and indeed uh, confirm that the de Broglie wavelength is indeed the wavelength that they're seeing from the interference pattern. Um, and then the other thing to remember is what is n? n is an integer. d is the spacing of the crystal. phi is the angle at which you see one of the interference um, fringes. n is an integer. I don't need to write that down. I'm not writing any of the rest down. But anyway, n is an integer. And so you've got your first order interference fringe at n equals 1, your second order at n equals 2, third order at n equals 3, as you go away from the, uh, the, the path that it would take if it went straight through. You've got your first order fringe, your second order fringe, your third order fringe, etc. n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. And I should mention about the crystals that I didn't mention when we talked about Bragg scattering was that there are actually different crystal planes um, well, I mean, you can see the pl these planes, I'm dr drawing everything in purple now, these planes here, but there are actually additional crystal planes, which are these planes here, and then 
uh, I'm, I'm not good with crystal structure, take chemistry, uh, but there are additional crystal planes. And so there's different distances associated with those crystal planes. So what you actually find for some crystals, right, that this distance here is different than this distance here, is that you actually get um, interference peaks, um, first order interference peaks. You get more than one first order interference peak. You get more because we're talking because you have more than one D. You got more than one D, and so you actually see multiple interference peaks that aren't due to first order, second order, third order. You actually see multiple interference peaks due to um, there are different crystal planes that are that that the um, that the waves are interfering from different Ds. Okay, let's just look at the experiment. Different ways to do this experiment, but one of the typical ways would be. Um, the way we do it in the physics lab. Let's take an evacuated tube. It's like a light bulb. And you have your electron gun at this end. You've got your accelerating potential. Um, oh, well, I guess, well, it doesn't matter how we accelerate it. But we've got our accelerating potential to create an electron beam. And then, so this is the beam path of the electron beam. And then you take a crystal and you put that crystal simply in the way and um the the details we don't need to we need don't need to be too worried about but we put the crystal in in the way um and then and what happens is the the beam will diffract and interfere off those off off of um the crystal so that the electrons will actually have a diffraction pattern and so now it's going to be in three dimensions so for, I guess let me try, try a different color. First order may diffract at some angle phi. That Let's say this is n equals one. But this is in three dimensions, so it's actually gonna be a circle. There's gonna be a circle on the screen over here. This is just like a big light bulb and you look at the end of the light bulb and you see a circle on that screen because it's gonna diffract at an angle phi in three dimensions, right, in a cone. And so then because there's multiple crystal planes, you will actually see another, let me draw a different color, another first order diffraction pattern. So this is n equals one for a different set of crystal planes. And then you will also, and th those are your primary rings that you'll get. Um, in the experiment that we do in the physics lab, there are two primary rings because there's two primary sets of crystal planes um, in the crystal that we look at. Uh, but then you might get dimmer second-order effects, right? So that would be your n equals 2. And again, I'm trying to draw this in three dimensions. You're looking at the end of this light bulb, and you simply see circles on the end of the light bulb. Okay. But that's, they're still each at an angle phi such that d sine phi equals n lambda. Well, Bragg scattering was able to be used with the known wavelength of light in order to uh, measure the spacing in crystal planes, and that's often what it's used for, right? We're using Bragg scattering in a sense backwards here. We're saying, okay, we know the distance between the crystal planes. Let's use it to measure the wavelength of the electrons, the electrons that are acting like their waves. So I'm going to make up some numbers. I'm not going to use necessarily correct numbers, but let's just make up some numbers. Let's say that the Dis distance between crystal planes in a particular uh, crystal that we're looking at is, or at least one of the sets of crystal planes is about 0.2 nanometers. Okay. Say that we see our primary, um, our primary interference pattern, our first order interference pattern at, I don't know, 33 degrees from the normal, uh, from the, from the uh, straight through line. What is the wavelength? of these electrons. Well, that's right. It's a pretty easy plug-in. Therefore, the wavelength of the electrons are d sine theta, d sine phi, sorry, d sine phi divided by n, and d is 0.2 nanometers. Phi is 33 degrees, and this is first order interference, so n equals one. Whoops, n equals one. This gives us a wavelength of the electrons of 0.11 nanometers. And we want to compare that and say, ooh, does that make sense? Does that compare to the energy, right? We've given the electrons an energy by accelerating them through an accelerating potential here, delta V. So the energy given to the electrons is E delta V, 
that's a delta, E delta V, and what is the wavelength of the electrons with E delta V? So I need to look at what I set my delta, so, so this, uh, the, this interference, this um, angle here, the 30, whoops, the 33 degrees, is going to be dependent on, theoretically, the energy of the electrons, because the energy of the electrons is what determines, according to de Broglie, de Broglie is what determines the wavelength. So we now need to see, and this is what Davison and Germer did, is do these two match? Okay, when I did this lecture, I confused two results. The general gist of it is absolutely correct, but I confused two results and actually did make a mathematical, therefore have a mathematical error. Um, so I don't really want to redo the lecture because I think it was fine as long as I correct the result. If the original path, oops, I want to make that black. If the original path is this one here, that path makes an angle theta with the plane. So the angle theta is the uh, direction, is, is the angle between the plane and the original path. The reflected and refracted is therefore the main path that is going now at an angle theta. So it's reflected at an angle theta to the plane is therefore an angle 2 theta from the original path, is an angle 2 theta from the original path. Okay, and so the first order interference is going to be along that reflected line at an angle theta. This should be theta here. It's going to be at, uh, along that original line. This is the original Bragg diffraction. And I just simply left off the two here. I was, there was a little bit of confusion between this two and this two, but they're different twos. Um, so in the Bragg um, diffraction from a crystal with light, we had derived 2d sine theta equals n lambda, where theta is the angle that you make with the Bragg plane. Now in the next to this, where we're uh, looking at the transmission the, the, the crystal as a transmission grating, it's not a reflection grating, it's actually slightly different where the, um, the axis is the original path, and so phi is the 2 theta that we see, right, that we see here. Phi is the angle from the original path, 2 theta. Um, and so this here is, because we're looking at, we're measuring angles in this apparatus from the original path, not from the crystal plane. So therefore, and this again should be a 2, I left off the 2, so therefore 2d sine, theta, uh, phi over 2 equals n lambda. So this is the Bragg. Uh, diffraction interference, and this is using the angle phi, which is the angle from the original path. So we got to put in um, theta equals phi over 2. And so uh, this calculation was incorrect. Um, so everywhere where we had uh, phi, phi equals 33 degrees, um, so this should have been phi over 2, and there should have been a 2 out here, 2 over 2. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and correct it because actually remember that for small angle sine of a small angle sine theta is approximately equal to theta for a small angle. Um, it turns out that, the, that that's going to, well, I'm, that, I'm not sure that matters. I'm not going to bother correcting it. You could go ahead and plug back in your numbers to check what this is going to be. It's going to be slightly different and therefore your energy is going to be slightly different, but it's not going to be very different. This is indeed correct, and this is just the Bragg scattering formula. This is the Bragg scattering formula applied to this apparatus. But notice that when you read the text, that you get yet another relationship. I know this picture is messy. Let me see if I can clean it up. The book for the Bragg scattering of electrons, they're calling the interatomic spacing capital D. And so this is, ends up being a capital D. But now, for some reason, which I'm not 100% sure, they're measuring yet a different angle. Let me give a different color. Um, green maybe hasn't been used. And they're now measuring the angle from the incident path, 
the black axis to the refract uh, to the um, diffracted beam to the in diffracted interfering beam. So they're now measuring this angle, which they're calling angle phi. So they're not so so that's um, sort of 180 degrees minus the phi from before from from the other page. Um, but they go ahead and derive and show that if you're measuring that angle, the angle from the uh, incident beam to the oh, oh and this is a, ref, a reflection grating. So there's the difference here is that this is the reflection grating, and what I had done is shown for what we use in lab. This is a transmission grating, transmission grating, and this is where I made my error is going to the transmission grating. But anyway, for their reflection grating, again, the Bragg scattering formula is still correct, but now they're measuring phi from the original beam to the reflected, refracted, uh, sorry, reflected, diffracted beam, and they're doing the geometry to show that n lambda is then d sine phi in this case. So in all three cases, we're using a different angle. In all three cases, we're using a different angle, and it's just geometry that allows for these three different formulas, which are really the same formula analyzed for three different angles. So just to make sure, it's a little bit, a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. But anyway, the, there are your uh, formulas for this page for the, for the reflection grading, and here's the formula for the transmission grading, um, looking at those different angles. Do these two match? Since I made up the numbers and I didn't make up the energy, we'll just go ahead and calculate what energy it should be, and then we can say, oh, then we would compare it to what energy it was. So what energy should it be? So remember the de Broglie wavelength, lambda is h over p. Now, the question is, is are they relativistic or not? Because if they're not relativistic, then the energy of the electrons is 1 half mv squared. But if they are relativistic, then remember that e squared equals p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. And they certainly don't need to be relativistic for this experiment, although they could be. Um, so let's just assume and, and you will have a chance in the homework to think about whether you should treat them relativistically or not. Um, but let's just assume that they're not relativistic. If they're not relativistic, remember that P is equal to MV. And if P is equal to MV, then you should be able to see, and this is an important relationship for classical uh, energy and momentum, because remember, this is the relativistic energy and momentum relationship. Classically, you get P squared over 2M equals E. So if it's non-relativistic, we can make the substitution for P as P is equal to the square root of 2ME. So lambda is equal to H over the square root of 2ME, non-relativistic. If the energy is low enough, then they are non-relativistic. Um, and so we can go ahead and say, okay, if lambda was 0.11 and it's an electron, oh, well, sorry, let me try that again. It's 0.11 nanometers. H is, uh, and then the question is, do we do this in EVs or do we do it in joules? Uh, we're generally better off when we're talking about these little things is doing things in EVs, so I'm going to look up H and EVs. Constant in, in, in EV units is 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15 EV times seconds. And then the square root of 2 times the mass of um, an electron in EVs is 0.511 times 10 to the 6 EVs or 0.511 MEVs. And in this case, we're just calling it an unknown is the energy. Well, we could, right, we've got to either make the unknown lambda or the unknown energy in order to make this comparison and see in, if indeed these electrons that are scattering from the crystal and interfering, are they acting like a de Broglie wave? Um, and so in this case, we're solving for E. So that's what we're solving for. I think some of you caught this, that the mass of the electron, what I gave you was the electron uh, rest energy, but the mass is EV per C squared. EV per C squared is the units there.
So just multiply, cross multiplying, I'll go ahead and do, do out the math a little bit. Cross multiplying and squaring, you get that. For the energy, you get that. And this is just a calculator plugin, but we do need to actually plug in C equals three times 10 to the eighth meters per second here. I think, I don't think there's any C's that cancel. So we need to plug the in what C is, and I'll do it all out. And since I don't have a good calculator, all I'm using is my phone, I do it out this way. And what I see is I get 124.5 EVs. Actually, that seems very reasonable. That's 124.5 volts that I'm accelerating the electrons through in order to see this diffraction pattern. And in reality, what we would do is we would say, then say, ooh, look at the apparatus. What is the voltage? Is it 124.5? Yes, it is. It matches. The electrons, de Broglie wavelength is indeed what is predicted. Now we're going to win a Nobel Prize. And we're done. That's it. That's the, that's the Davison-Germer experiment. Pretty exciting. It showed that electrons indeed have the de Broglie wavelength. Um, and you can do this with both the relativistic and non-relativistic, but this indeed would be non-relativistic energies. Um, and uh, so we confirm that matter has wave-like properties. These have been seen with electrons, neutrons, um, and other small particles. So really, this is the key to quantum mechanics. The key to quantum mechanics is um, that light, elect, uh, photons, uh, sorry, light has wave, -like wa wave properties and particle properties, and matter has wave particles and particle properties, and the de Broglie wavelength is the last thing that brings it all together. The Davison-Germer experiment, 1925, is the last thing that brings it all together, and then by the late 1920s, quantum mechanics, as far as I can tell, is reasonably well accepted. Okay, next.